Hi guys, this is gsn1.com and I'm here with the Coolpad Modina, the first Coolpad phone that we're testing. It's a phablet that was launched in August and just in case you were wondering, it's a low mid-range handset and the company Coolpad was founded in 1993 and it makes quite a few devices that are popular in Asia and now in Europe as well. This product is priced at 149 euros and design-wise it reminds me a bit of the latest Huawei handsets maybe a bit of the Huawei Mate models. Its case is made of polycarbonate, but it imitates the metal pretty well. It's a matte polycarbonate and the colors available are white, gold, this one here, and black. Since it's made, it doesn't uh, take up your fingerprints, which is a good thing. The front side takes up your fingerprints, but not very much. It's a bit wide, even for a phablet, but it has good grip in the user's hand. And um, there's an interesting and shiny chrome imitation all around the edges. You can see it here, but the frame is thinner than usual. In spite of that, the phone feels pretty solid. In thickness, it measures 8.6 millimeters and it weighs 158 grams, which means it's uh, quite thicker than the Ligu Lid One that we tested a while ago. That one measures 6.9 millimeters in thickness and it weighs 145 grams. This model is uh, still a bit more compact than the ASUS Zenfone 2, so that's a good thing. That one is 10.9 mm thick and weighs 170 grams, so this is lighter than the ASUS Zenfone 2. It has a solid build and because it's very wide, it's not very easy to use with a single hand. As you can see, I am not reaching all the screen areas with my big finger here. Now at the front side, you can find the earpiece sensors from camera. There is the uh, LED notification right here. Then we got uh, some pretty big bezels for the screen. You can see them here and here. Then the three capacitive buttons at the bottom. So that's the front. Now at the back, main camera, microphone and LED flash here. Plus the speaker. This is a removable back cover. Back, back cover, excuse me. And the removing part is not very easily done, as you can see. Trying to perform it flawlessly. Here we go. Almost done. And that's it. So this is the back cover removed. Below it you can find the battery. The two SIM slots, one is GSM, one is LTE, and the micro SD card slot available right here, plus the speaker a bit on the small side. Of course, you can put the back cover on easily, uh, although you took it off uh, quite uh, hard. At the top we find the audio jack, while at the bottom we find the micro USB port and a small microphone next to it. On the left side, volume buttons that are separated but offer good feedback. On the right side we got the power button also with good feedback. I noticed that the phone has sloped edges. If you look at it from the profile you can see what I mean. They're not rounded, they're just a bit sloped like the older iPads. And uh, to be honest, the Coolpad Modina actually looks a bit more expensive than it is. If you look at it as a first sight, you feel it's a golden metallic handset. Well, it's not, but it looks the part. So. The design is quite fine for a 149 euro device. Now as far as the hardware is concerned, the handset offers a 5.5 inch screen. It's an IPS LCD with a resolution of 960 over 540 pixels. Inside the handset you can find the quad core Qualcomm Snapdragon 410 processor. It's a 1.2 GHz 64-bit unit, just in case you're wondering. It's accompanied by 1 GB of RAM and 8GB of storage plus a microSD card slot that supports up to 32GB extra. Up front, 2MP shooter for selfies, while at the back we got an 8MP camera with LED flash on the connectivity side. There's LTE category 4 with 150MPS download speeds, HSPA+, dual SIM, dual standby support, Bluetooth 4.0, there's Wi-Fi 802.11, however, you only get Wi-Fi 802.11, G and N, there is no B, there is no A, there is no AC. You got a GPS and GLONASS available here, micro USB 2.0 and FM radio. The sensors on this model include the brightness sensor, ambient light sensor and the proximity sensor as well as accelerometer. 
so the hardware is pretty much okay in spite of that connectivity, connectivity thing I mentioned before, no Wi-Fi A, B or A, C, and the low resolution of the screen may be a bummer for some people. Now I want to talk about the battery, and uh, we're dealing with a 2500mAh battery here. On paper it should provide you with uh, 10 hours of 2G talk time or 330 hours of 2G standby time. In our test, that involves HD video playback in a loop with Wi-Fi on and brightness at 200 lux, we achieved a pretty impressive 9 hours and 45 minutes of playback which is great. We beat the Samsung Galaxy Note 3 and it's 9 hours and a half, the OnePlus 2 and it's 9 hours and 10 minutes, and the Galaxy A5 and it's 9 hours. Still, we scored below the Asus Zenfone Selfie with 10 hours and 11 minutes, HTC One M8 10 hours and 15 minutes, and the Allview X2 Soul Pro 9 hours and 54 minutes. There's also the PC Mark test, this one simulates continuous usage, and here we got 5 hours and 52 minutes. We beat the Sony Xperia M5 that has 5 hours and 48 minutes, the HTC Desire 820 with its 5 hours and 25 minutes and the Huawei P8 with 5 hours and 31 minutes. Still we scored below the LG AKA 6 hours and 22 minutes in the same test, Huawei Mate S 6 hours and 26 minutes and finally the Asus Zenfone Selfie 6 hours and 47 minutes. The charging of the battery is done in 2 hours and 55 minutes, it's a bit on the long side, but it's within the regular limits. At least it charges faster than the Xperia M5 that needs 3 hours and 4 minutes, or the LIGU LEED1 that will require 3 hours of charging. We also charge faster than the Sony Xperia Z3 with its 3 hours and 30 minutes of charging, however there are many phones out there that will charge faster than the Coolpad Modena, like the M-Star S700 2 hours and 45 minutes, LG AKA 2 hours and 8 minutes and Lumia 930 2 hours and 15 minutes. Of course we also have battery saving features and you can find them right here under battery and under battery saver, they're pretty straightforward, just activate the option and that's it and you can set the percentage to activate it at so basically it limits vibration, CPU usage, background data and that's about it. A pretty solid battery, nothing to complain about here, maybe except for the charging, but even that's within limits. Now as far as the acoustics go, we got a small speaker here as I shown you before and uh, you have to resort to play music as your music player and the equalizer is, uh, as you'll see in a minute, an atypical one. It's the Snapdragon Audio Plus, it's not the stock one from Lollipop and what we've got here is a bunch of presets for various music genres and a custom area with 5 custom frequencies to tweak. Then you can activate bass boost and surround sound only with headphones and also options that relate to small room, medium room, large room or plate. You can actually fill those if activated. Okay, and now let's go to the tunes and let's actually listen to some music. Okay, so as you just heard, there's a bit of muffling going on here. In spite of that, the sound is pretty clear. We have very good high notes, an okay bass, good guitars, okay volume, and in spite of the muffling, everything is just fine. Now let's see the headphones bundle with Coolpad Modena. They go something like this, pretty regular, a pretty thick wire that's totally not tangle free, so it can get tangled and we got a pretty ugly remote here with a singular button and these two buds that are quite long made of plastic feeling a bit on the cheap side but they're a bit comfy okay so they're loud they have good isolation an okay bass clear sound and a nice equalizer to go with their experience because as i said before once you connect them you can trigger new features 
in the area I shown you before. So equalizer and this time you can tweak the bass boost, surround sound and play with these options easily thanks to Snapdragon Audio Plus. Since we're here and we're using the headphones, we might as well go to the FM radio, provided we can find it. Nope, not this one. It's here and it has a surprisingly good looking interface, totally not stock. We got a nice UI, we got a speaker option and sadly it takes a lot of time to find stations which is a bit of a bummer for radio buffs. Okay, found five stations but my original experience told me that it wasn't very easy to find them. Okay, let's put the headphones aside and maybe see what's happening with the decibels. As usual, we use the decibel meter to measure the power of the speaker at the back and the results go something like this. So at the back of the phone, a pretty impressive 84.9 decibels, which drops obviously at the front because of the muffling, and it drops to 74.8, so around 10 decibels, which is a big, big difference. At least with the bigger value, the 84.9, we surpass the iPhone 6S Plus that achieves 84.2 decibels, LG G Flex 2, 82.9 decibels, and OnePlus 2, 82 decibels. Still, we're far away from the LG G4's 87.8 decibels, HTC One M 9's 86.9 decibels, or the Sony Xperia E4 G's 86 decibels. The acoustics are okay, too bad for the muffling, but I'm happy with what we get for the low price tag paid for this model. Now, as far as the screen goes, throughout the review you may have thought it's a good screen, but the tests will show you it's not that good. So, 5.5 inch IPS LCD, a QHD with a small Q, so 960 over 540 pixels, and I'm going to have to use player, excuse me, photos as the video player. There's no video player here, no specialized video player, and the experience goes like this. Okay, so first of all, good colors, wide viewing angles, as usual for an IPS. The screen seems bright enough, the contrast is mediocre, at least in sunlight, and the pixels are of the RGB stripe kind. And then you can see the pixels here under the microscope. And then we move to the lux meter test. That was a huge letdown. So using the lux meter, we achieved 204 lux units, which has to be the lowest value measured ever here at gsndon.com. So as I said before, um, it tricks the eye because uh, in regular usage, you may see that the screen seems a bit brighter than 204 lux. Since the value is so low, it means it doesn't surpass any models we've tested, but we can tell you which models surpass it. So, the first in line, at the bottom, is the Sony Xperia E4 with 217 lux, then the LG G Flex 1, 246 lux, and the Asus Zenfone 2 Laser, 274 lux. So, in real life, seems a bit brighter than this underwhelming result, and let's see which special options are available for this display. Okay, display, brightness level, adaptive brightness, wallpaper, daydream, font size and uh, cast screen and blur effect. So overall, uh, while it may seem okay, videos look okay, games look okay, the lux matter never lies. Now let's talk about the cameras. So at the back, 8 megapixel shooter, f2.2 aperture, 28mm lens, autofocus and supposedly 1 second startup. At the front, 2 megapixel shooter, BSI, 720p videos and f2.4 aperture. Let's see how fast we can get the camera to open, but before that, close down all the apps, make some cleaning in the memory, and here we go. Not that fast, I have to say, but also not very shabby, so somewhere in between fast and slow, let's say mid-level. Okay, so the interface is pretty straightforward. Uh, However, I have to object something here. As you can see, the interface is a bit laggy sometimes, especially with applying effects like, I don't know, HDR or other special selections. It happened to me that this interface and camera app froze quite a few times. Okay, so on the left side, from camera shortcut, then the flash options, and then at the top, we got HDR, bunch of filters, a few of them compared to what other phones offer. And then we got the settings. Settings include timer picture, brightness, that refers to the screen only, touch to take pictures, location, auto-scene detection and advanced settings. 
which are simply storage shutter sound picture resolution, a very strange option of 8 megapixels in 4 to 3, dropping all the way to 2 megapixels in 16 to 9. I maybe would have wished 6 megapixels or 5, but we're using what we're getting here. So those are all the options, very few of them, very minimalistic experience. On the right side of the screen, we got the shutter button, gallery shortcut, pro mode, photo mode, video mode and the main capture modes, HDR, beauty, capture smiles, normal and night shot. If you go to video, you'll see that the options include resolution, 720p, 480p or 1080p, a bunch of filters and that's everything. If you go to the pro mode, here you get the same settings as before, plus some extras shown as these semicircular lines. So we got white balance. This can trigger that freeze I mentioned before. We got exposure with a surprisingly large number of values. ISO going up to 800. And focus from macro to infinity. You've seen all of them before on other handsets, so nothing surprising here. Okay, we're done with that. Time to go to the actual camera experience. So, I would say that the focus speed is quite okay. Maybe a bit better than I expected at first sight. We got 6x zoom fluid but losing a lot of quality in the process and these two frames here for metering and exposure can be arranged all over the screen as I'm doing right now. Picture taking quite fast. When they said the one second camera use probably they refer to the picture taking. However if you rush it I cannot guarantee that it will be very clear. So that's the shot I've just taken. A bit shaky, a bit moved but decent colors. Overall, not many options in the camera interface and some freezes, but now let's see the pictures. I have to mention they were taken in uh, mid-December on a reasonably sunny day. We've taken 8 megapixel shots and 2 megapixel shots testing both resolutions. Strangely, there is no panorama option in here. We start off with these uh, 2 megapixel shots that are taken indoors with pretty good colors, but also a bit of grain. they 2 megapixel captures after all. I would have to say that throughout the pictures we got realistic colors. There is a bit of blur in the landscape images. If you really zoom in and look at the leaves of the trees, you see that the blur is very clear. Okay, and we also tried out a selfie. It's a 2 megapixel camera at the front. You can feel that the background is very blurry, but the face texture is quite okay. Looks like human skin, alright, so no problem with the selfie, at least in this uh, price range for the tablet. Next up we got the HDR here, as you can see a regular shot, HDR shot, it doesn't help very much from what I noticed, so not of much use. On some of the pictures we'll be able to see in the gallery and be sure to check out our gallery on Google+, you'll notice there's a bit of a fog going about in the images, like a sort of white layer on the image, it wasn't a foggy day, that's the way the camera behaves. Okay, more shots, this is also very white, strangely white and the colors are a bit faded out. Yet another layer of white applied here, especially at the top of the image, and if you zoom in, you'll see that the quality loss is quite clear. Okay, and when photographing these uh, toys, I found that the colors were quite good, but again, a taste of blur also happened here. Some blurry shots again. It may stem from the fact that the camera doesn't uh, focus well or it doesn't adapt its exposure well. By the way, an attempt at HDR turned everything into blue and slightly purple. It's also very strange to take shots at 8 megapixels and 2 megapixels. I maybe would have wished to take at 5 or 6. And uh, if I were to make a comparison, I would place these captures below the ones of the M-Star S700 quite a bit and the Ligu lead one. They play about in the same league although those have 13 megapixels camera and this one has an 8 megapixel camera. I also went back one year ago when I tested the Carbon Sparkle V with its 5 megapixel camera and that one clearly beats this one with its 8 megapixel shooter. And uh, overall I have to say that these shots are not very impressive here. We tried to create some macros, some close-ups of these plants, couldn't make it, washed out shots all the way. Probably the colors and the selfies are the only good things about the camera and my biggest regret is the lack of a proper resolution for 16 to 9 capture. Overall mediocre photo capture, it's only good for the random Facebook post. And now let's go to videos. So videos, 
are taken in Full HD, MP4, 30 frames per second and a 20 mega per second bitrate, that's actually quite good. So video number one. Features, a pretty okay exposure change. A reasonable quality, poor stabilization and good colors. Then video number two. Let's find it. This is video number two. It's a big disappointment. It's shaky. It has that layer of, let's say, fog I mentioned before. It feels like HD or SD, sometimes not even full HD, sadly. Sudden exposure change for the worse, not for the better. And finally, the last video, this one here. Uh, this is finally a good one. O okay colors, uh, okay quality. And... Uh, when we started to zoom in, you'll see that there's quite a bit of quality loss. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. We zoom in and quality drops significantly, which you cannot see on this QHD screen, QHD with a small Q, but you can see that on the PC display, obviously. It's also a bit overexposed. So I would have to say that this camera, this 8 megapixel camera is about... Uh, 90% less impressive than the other 8 megapixel camera we tested this year, so it's below 90% of all the 8 megapixel cameras we tested at gsndome.com. It's also below some of the 5 megapixel shooters, which is certainly no compliment. Doesn't have a panorama, has too few options, it only offers you the 8 or 2 megapixel resolution, it's too wide, so too many defects to ignore, so not a very impressive camera. If you want to do a bit of photo editing, You can go here and press this button here and then play with options like auto light, color, pop, vignette or filters or the usual auto rotate, crop and things like that. We also did a temperature test and after playing the game Riptide GP2 for 15 minutes we achieved 38.3 degrees Celsius so this means there is no overheating here which is quite okay. Now let's see what the browser is all about. The pre-installed web browser is Chrome and it's a bit on the slow side, so let's access gsnone.com. As I said before, a bit on the slow side, at least the scrolling is pretty smooth. The keyboard of choice, the pre-installed one is SwiftKey, and we got an option that includes a swipe, among others, trying to write uh, hello and wrote gecko, anyway. Okay, and SwiftKey comes with a few options in this area here. We got resize, layout, undock, keys, typing, more. We got options for the teams and an access to the store and finally you can get your own account and the predicted words for you which are displayed here. So overall pretty well spaced and pretty comfy. Now it's time to talk about the connectivity. So this is a dual SIM handset with LTE support. It supports LTE category 4 which means you can reach download speeds of up to 150 mega per second. There is no Wi-Fi A, Wi-Fi AC or Wi-Fi B here and uh, we got a speed dial functionality, uh, we don't have NFC, still we get uh, pretty clean and clear calls, there is an OK signal, at least the cellular one, the Wi-Fi signal is sometimes at 50% for no reason, and I have to say that the calls could be a bit, but only a bit louder, but at least they're clear, and the connectivity speed is quite good. Now it's time to go to the benchmarks and see what happens here. So I decided to compare the Coolpad Modina with the LG AKA, the Ligu Lead one and the Sony Xperia E4G. This is a battle between the Snapdragon 410 plus 1GB of RAM versus the Snapdragon 400 plus 1.5GB of RAM, the MediaTek MT6587 plus 1GB of RAM and finally the MediaTek MT6732 plus 1GB of RAM. So, in Quadrant we scored a pretty disappointing 2208 points, the LG AKA had 8774, Ligu Lead 1 7172 and the Sony Xperia E4G 10250. Next up there is Antutu but in two versions so first there is the older version 5.7.1 with 18,000 points. And then we got a new version, which is version 6.0 with 23,000 points. In the meantime, the LG AKA scores 18,403 points 
while the LIGU lead won 18,360 points and finally the Sony Xperia E4G 32,753 points. There is also Nena Mark in the mix and in Nena Mark we registered the score of 59.5 frames per second, the LG AKA 56.7 frames per second, LIGU lead won 53.1 frames per second and the Sony Xperia E4G 59.7 frames per second. There is also Velamo in the mix and in Velamo we scored 1938 points uh, superior to the LG AKA with its uh, 1810 points, LIGU lead won 1682 and the Sony Xperia E4G 2704. 3D Mark also brought us a score that's not very impressive and not very high. In the iStorm Unlimited test we had 4,479 points, the LG AKA had 4,443 points and the LIGU lead one 2,883 points, while the Sony Xperia E4G was at 5,030 points. Geekbench 3 is also here with a score of 468 in the single core test and 1315 in the multi core test while the LG AKA had 338 over 1070 and the LIGU lead one 350 over 1178. Finally the Sony Xperia E4G had 726 over 2167 in the very same test. Uh, in GFX we didn't get a very conclusive result as you'll be able to see very soon. As you can see the 1080p test didn't run all the way through but we got uh, 8.3 frames per second in the ALU test, ALU 2. Anyway, you should know that the LG AKA scored 5.8 frames per second in the TRX 1080p test while the LIGU lead one 4.1 frames per second and the Sony Xperia E4 G8 frames per second. There is also a speed test here via Wi-Fi. We achieved 23 mega per second in download and 22 in upload while the LG AKA had 24 and 20 respectively. Finally the LIGU lead one had 20 and 20 and we don't have the speed test for the Xperia E4G. In browser mark our score was 1119 while the LG phone had 1425, the LIGU phone 865 and the Xperia phone only 718. In Sun Spider, the lower the better and we had a big score which is not good. 18, 23 and uh, this is worse than the 1130 of the LG AKA but better than the 11, excuse me, better than the 1864 of the LIGU lead one. And also this on Xperia E4G 928 so much better than this one, twice as good. Base Mark X, medium quality test, 4076, all the scores were pretty close here so the LG AKA 4216, LIGU lead one 4833 and Sony Xperia E4G 8084, that's a pretty big difference. So overall if I were to compare all these four handsets, the Coolpad Modena only wins 1 out of 11 benchmarks, so the results are not very impressive. In uh, comparison with the LG AKA that uses a CPU from 2013, it only wins 6 out of 11 battles. These are not fantastic results, but also the phone does not suffer from lag, which is always a good thing. It has a fluid user interface and aside from the camera stutter and freeze, I have to say I didn't meet with lag no matter what I did and no matter in what ways I use this device. It's also good for gaming, so if you want to play a session of Riptide GP2, we can go ahead without a problem, without a stutter and without lag. Ok, so the graphics are looking fine. Responsive controls, nice looking water. And nice speed sensation. That motion blur is well done. Good reflections, once again good render of the water, nice water drop effects. And you get the idea, you get the gist of it, good for uh, um, running games like this and also without lag and with a fluid user interface. Now if you're wondering about the software, well this is Lollipop, it's Android 5.1.1 Lollipop 
with some customization but not major one so first things first there is no app drawer all the apps are on the screen on the home screens in folders multitasking looks like this with the carousel in the mix and if you keep the home screen pressed you'll be able to see widgets which are the stock lollipop ones and then we got wallpaper section effects that apply when switching from one home screen to another accordion flip carousel overview zoom in rotate cube in and then we got preferences like uh, cool ui style icon icon labels switch over and scroll wallpaper now as far as the drop down area goes it's a two-tiered approach notifications here and cards and then the quick settings that are not the stock ones only the colors are stock lollipop the icons are modified from the stock options we also have a very interesting invert colors option it's not useful it's more of a gimmick but it's here in case you want it if you go to the settings area you'll see that the interface is also not the stock one so it has been customized as well connectivity options display storage battery apps system profiles included here location security including encryption and screen pinning language and input we also have smart control that includes wake up gestures you can double tap to wake slide up to unlock slide down to take photos draw a c to open a dialer and so on and so forth draw an m for the music then you can associate certain tasks to the capacitive buttons below the screen so those are the options available here other than that backup and reset date and time accessibility printing and about phone now as far as the apps goes, as I said before, there's no app drawer, so all the apps are straight on the home screens. So the pre-installed app list goes like this, play music, calendar, calculator, we got this Google folder here with Gmail, Hangouts, Drive, Keep, Play, Newsstand, Google Settings, Voice Search, Google News and Weather, then we have Maps, Email and Play Store, and then we find here Settings, Play Games and the Social Folder with Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitter and Messenger. I remind you, I'm only showing you the pre-installed apps, not the ones I installed. Then we have a system folder including a clock, downloads, FM radio, record, WPS office for productivity, file explorer, ES file explorer that is, Zuime weather, contacts, Swift key, and two SIM toolkit applications. Then Skype, Facebook, YouTube, photos, and that's pretty much it. Those are the pre-installed apps. I would have to say that uh, theoretically we don't have bloatware, but if you consider that we only get 8 GB of internal storage, we kind of do so maybe eliminate those social networking apps and make more room in the future okay so this is it this is the coolpad modina the very first coolpad handset we're testing here at gsandon.com and it's time for the verdict on the pro side this phone actually looks more expensive than it is the meta limitation is quite successful here it has a good battery no lag fluid interface it runs games pretty much okay it has a pretty good acoustics and uh, it takes uh, reasonable selfies and decent video capture uh, and it also looks brighter than its underperforming screen shows in a deluxe meter test those are the pros and all the cons obviously we don't have uh, wi-fi b a or ac only 8 gigabytes of storage are here the back side tend to tends to muffle the sound of the phone on a flat surface there is the very low brightness actually the lowest we ever measured the lack of many camera options including panorama is also important the photographs taken with the main camera are slightly whitish the benchmarks are on the low side and the camera ui freeze is certainly a con and when i say con i mean uh, fours and cons anyway i have to say that this is the type of phone that uh, looks and acts more expensive than it actually is at 149 euros or so and uh, the standout points here two negative standout points the camera photos that are whitish and the screen that could be better other than that i'm happy with the lack of lag with how comfy and good looking the phone is we have to admit it is pretty solid and it imitates metal pretty well it runs games okay has a good battery and a solid build so aside from the screen brightness which once again only the lux meter tells that story regular usage did, did not and finally it's a pretty decent mid-range handset that uh, uh, would deserve a grade of let's say 8.3 out of 10 if I were to grade it. Anyway, this is jsnlone.com and this is the Coolpad Modina, the very first uh, Coolpad handset we test. Good mid-range phone aside from some aspects of the camera and the screen. This is it from us, bye bye.